Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome back. This week, we have a special guest, and I'm so honored to have him on the show. We have here Paul Kaiser from the United States, who was, and I hope I get that all right, record label owner, promoter, songwriter, singer, arranger, writer. Did I forget a record label owner? Did I forget anything, Paul? Uh, you said producer. Yes, um okay teacher <laughs> and uh paul how you had a tremendous career and you were also you, you discovered a, a group and we will come to that later on who was so close to having that big breakthrough and from today's point of view mm -hmm. it's for everybody impossible why they didn't have the breakthrough but we will discuss this later on paul how did you start a music business how did that happen for you well, um, let me begin. When I was eight years old, there was a place called Bergen Point, an amusement park. And in that amusement park, there was a little recording machine that you put a quarter in and it records your record. And I loved music at the age of eight. And so I put my quarter in and I sung my first song that I wrote it was called My Darling Dear. My darling dear, to think that you're here to see my baby do up, do up. <laughs> and it was a one minute recording, and I loved that. And that's how there was no other thing that I really wanted to do. I love music. And my mother would uh, sometimes help him work out at a record shop, and she would bring home this artist, Roy Hamilton. And uh, you'll never walk alone. And there was something special about that song. The difference was, it, it was different than the regular, what would be called soul or doo-wop songs. It had horns and it had strings and I love that orchestration music. So at 11 years old, Shining Shoes, I was on in Jersey City where I grew up on Newark Avenue and it was a place to say recording studio. And I went upstairs with my shoe shine box and I said, how much does it cost? He said, seven bucks. I went home, got my boys together. We all were around 11 years old, 12 years old. And we went in the studio. We didn't know nothing about harmony, but we did it. And we recorded. And the guy boosted up the reverb, and it yeah. sounded fantastic to us. That's how I actually started. The lady across the street from me where I lived at on Oak Street, uh, she would have me to sweep her walk off and do different errands. She was a music teacher, piano teacher. And so she would have me come in because we couldn't afford to pay for lessons. And I took lessons. And my um, and my godfather, he was a Saxton at a church, um, an AME church. And I would help him dust off the benches. And I'd go up into the choir loft. And there was this organ, beautiful organ. And when he wasn't there, I would turn it on and I'd just be playing it and playing it. And the reverend came in one day. He said, is that you, Paul? And I said, uh oh, I'm in trouble. And he said, no, keep on. You can play that organ whenever you want to. And so I developed, you know, playing. And I saw I did was play. My mother played piano. And so at the age of, I guess, 13, 14 years old, um, I, um, you know, my group became, became better. We got better. And, uh, the guys on, on the group was a guy named Ron Thomas, Joe Covington, uh, Billy Scruggs, MacArthur Mumford, and myself. We had an opportunity, you know, a guy named Sugar Bob Kirkland heard us singing on the street corner and he took us in the studio, you know, to record. But there was one problem back in those days. The bass, boom, 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 you know, the bass played an important part in the song. And our bass player, the night before, tried to steal a car and got caught. And we were without a bass. <laughs> so the session didn't go too well because the bass guitar tried to do what the bass did. And that was, that was sad. Then um, um, growing up, going further, I'm going to, um, I hope that I didn't leave, you know, anything out. Um, there were producers in our area. It was uh, Marion and Hal Weiss. Uh, they did 
Ronnie in the highlights, I wish that we were married and things like that. Well, um, they took a liking, you know, uh, to me. And um, I went down there and I played about 35 songs for them. And they didn't do nothing with me then. I was about 14 years old, I guess. And I would found out, go to 1650 Broadway in New York and shop your songs. So me and my boys, we did something in the studio. And I felt that this was a great song, but it, it wasn't. Anyway, I went to New York and I started from the top floor of 1650 Broadway all the way down to the bottom floor and got turned down by everybody. I played hooky from school. And just so happened the truant officer happened to call my house to say, how was Paul doing? And my mother said, he's in school. They said, no, he's not. And when I came home, I got it. My mother was furious with me. And so um, where were you? I was in New York. New York? I said, yeah, I was trying to shop my songs. <laughs> and I was on punishment. You know, I was, I, you know, you know, that was it. So as time went on, you know, uh, uh, going on, I got a little bit better in doing things. I, I also played saxophone, tenor sax. And as time went on, I began to um, uh, listen more and more to music. Motown was just about coming out then, you know, uh, with their songs. Um, my buddy Ron Thomas and I, we, we decided to go into a little, you know, venture to record, well, a group called The Superlatives. And I wrote this song called I Still Love You by The Superlatives. And it did, I guess, well overseas or somewhere. But anyway, um, that was produced by Marion and Hal Weiss. And so when they told me they wanted to, they wanted to record my songs, uh, they told me also, well, we're taking 50% of your song. And I said, okay, I don't care. You know, I was happy. And they took 50% of my song, and the Superlatives came out with a record. In the meantime, I met a guy in Philly. His name was Tommy Bell, Tom Bell. He had no hits. I had no hits. And so um, I, I wrote this song called Burning Sensation. And um, so I have searched by Robbie Lawson. And it was a 17, 18 years old, somewhere around that time there. And we, we recorded it. Tommy played the keyboard on it, helped me with the arrangements on the vibes and stuff. And great song. I Have Searched, I thought, was the song. But that wasn't the song. It was um, eventually a, a couple of years later. And I had it on my own label, you know, Kaiser Records. I had no money. So I couldn't do um, Mother Stampers. So I just did a strike off on the, uh, the record. And lo and behold, by that time, you know, back in those days, when you graduate from high school, on prom night, you get engaged, you get married. Back then, you got married young. And me being young, a teenager, you get married, you know, you start a family, and then you, you know, you want to still be a producer. So um, I'm going to come back to that Robbie Lawson thing. Um, having a job, I was a meter reader, you know, um, full time job doesn't give you much time to, um, you know, produce and write songs. I hated the job. And my dream was to be, you know, be, become a record producer, a ranger. So I was, I went to college, was going to college during the night, and it was very, very difficult, very difficult. And uh, But I did get an opportunity to go to Detroit, to go to Motown, Mickey Stevens and those people out there. And I was accepted to get, to get in as a, as a songwriter. But there were so many of them out there. You know, you, you, how are you going to, you know, break through the door? But for me to hear that I was good enough to be a, a, you know, to be a songwriter, I said, man, this is an opportunity. My buddy Ron Thomas, he came out to Detroit to celebrate with me and everything. And um, we had friends that we, you know, party with. But the thing was, I had a family. You know, I had a job. I couldn't, I couldn't stick. I couldn't go out there. So as time went on, you know, you, you, you reach the age of 20 years old, you know, 20 was somewhere around the age and everything falls apart for you. You know, you got a job you don't like, you know, you, you have a responsibility as a family man. 
So what are you going to do? You know, um, eventually you have no job. You know, um, you know, things become very, very difficult, you know, uh, for you. The next thing you know, you are a young kid out there on your own because you got this dream. You're chasing this dream of becoming, you know, a songwriter and record producer. So the story begins here, whereas um, I had no job, I had no money, but, um, and I'm, I'm winding myself <laughs> back home. Uh, and, um, but I was collecting unemployment, you know, I think $60 a week or something like that. And that enabled me, like I was told, okay, you don't have your job anymore. So now prove yourself, prove yourself that you're going to be this songwriter or you could be this person that you dreamed of being. And so I started out with, with, with that in mind. I had six months, you know, to, you know, prove myself. That's when I uh, was at this studio in the General Square, Jersey City, a guy named Stan Krause on the record shop. He was up there and I um, did a couple of songs. Well, group called the Roy Counts, the Royal Counts. They did a couple of my songs. Uh, they didn't put my name on it, but it was uh, made up my mind. And if the people check that song out by the Royal Count, you see other groups recording that song, Made Up My Mind, and also The Time. And you, a lot of local groups, they, they, they sung that song, you know, right on YouTube. So um, as things in the studio wasn't going as well but what i started doing was lead sheets for people and people would ask me could i just do a couple of charts arrangements so i started doing you know little arrangements making a little bit of money but i knew i had to have an education you know uh, uh, that, that that college degree and eventually um i went back to college my buddy ron thomas who worked with me you know um uh he because we got to we were ron thomas and i on the Robbie Lawson song, um, actually give him credit, we did it together. He was my biggest critic, and later on I'm going to tell you about that. And so um, going back to school, um, uh, moving moving right on up, there was a group called the, um, uh, the Superbs, and I did a song back then called The Dawning of Love, who eventually changed their name to Devotion. And um, when I had the group Devotion, uh, that was um, the lead singer was Retta Young, you know, uh, Henrietta, who uh, who the funny thing about it was that with Henrietta and them, they were doing a prom and uh, yep, that's Henrietta. <laughs> and we all were about the same age and Henrietta was always a complainer. So anyway, we did a prom down in um, Baltimore and on the show was Devotion and also the moments, um, that was it. But I recorded about four or five songs with Henrietta. And um, uh, she, she was a very, very talented uh, a girl. But, you know, she was in love with, um, you know, Al Goodman. And they and they got married. But I became friends with, you know, um, all of them up to, until this, this day here. And, um, well, Al has passed away. So all of a sudden... I get a call um, from Stan Krause on the record shop in Jersey City. And there were people from England that was calling about this record, Burning Sensation by Robbie Lawson. And so Stan said, told them that he said, I, I think Paul's back in college. Uh, you know, um, you know, I, I can reach out and try to find him and say, and so they called me and Stan reached out to me and, and they called me. So um, I said, what, what about the song? And they said, we love that song, you know, and we would like to get a license to, um, you know, release it over here. And lo and behold, it was already released over there. It was a big record over there in, in Europe. I didn't know nothing about it. And so they offered me, if I could get the tapes, because they tried to copy the song on the 45, but the 45 was so grainy, they couldn't copy it. So... Um, they um, bought it, so so they told me, we'll give you a couple thousand dollars or whatever it was if you could just get that, you know, the tapes to me. I said, a couple thousand dollars? <laughs> so 
I ran, uh, I came home and looked in the closet. And on the floor of the closet were the tapes. And the mice were already nipping on the tapes. So I ran to a studio and I was able to get a good, you know, copy to send them. On the agreement, I said to them, I'll let you give you the license. I said, but don't use the label, the Kaiser label, the way I have it. You got to do a different color, do something. And they agreed. And they sent me the money and I sent them the tapes. And, you know, I didn't know it was a hit, you know, but it was a big record. And that was the B side. It wasn't the A side. So, you know, I was happy with that. That money that I got gave me an incentive to do, you know, other things. And that brings me to the um, a group called the New Sound Express, which eventually became a group called Rise, which I produced later. And they were like young young kids, you know, with a band. And I, um, you know, um, got them and I took, a, you know, I recorded them. Um, the song that I did was called Ain't It Good Enough. And um, um, what was the other side? One of them. Um, Curtis Mayfield songs, um, you know, uh, I've been trying. So a, a college friend of mine, or a friend of mine, his name was Tom Vetri. Tommy was a wild, uh, <laughs> wild guy. And we went in the studio together. And um, I got to give him the credit, you know, um, for that. And I arranged the songs, you know, put the song, wrote the songs and um, put it together. And ain't it good enough? came out good, decided to do it on the Silver Dollar record label. And the, the song made noise, it did, did very, very well. But also being in school, uh, that was, you know, still kind of rough. But um, there was a, a distributor in um, New York that was trying to get copies of it. It was getting airplay on all the radio stations. And um, uh, I went down to Baltimore to promote it. And um, you know, somebody said to me, you know, you got to go in there and you got to, you know, take care of the, um, <laughs> how can I put it, the the um, uh, the DJs, you know. Well, they're all going now, so they don't have to worry about the being, you know. So I went in. I didn't know nothing about doing stuff like that. And when I went into the, the, the DJ booth, the guy said, he had his hat, he said, put it under here. And so... I said, put it under there. I didn't know it. And so I went to my pocket and pulled out a, t I had a $10 bill. And so I put it underneath his hat. And he looked and his eyes popped out. He said, uh, what did you do? <laughs> and I said, uh, is something wrong? Is anything wrong? And he knew that I was serious. I didn't know what, you know, what he was talking about. And he said, he said, is anybody crazy enough to put that underneath my hat? He got to be real. He started laughing. And he said, I tell you what, I want the group down here. And I said, okay, right, no, no problem. So that came into a good relationship with that DJ. And uh, I took the group, you know, um, you know, down there. And they did a couple of shows. And then we went to this place. And it was amateur night, so some kind of night. And there was this group, you know, you know, performing, you know, before my group, uh, the New Sound Express, went on. And I'm, I'm listening, and so I'm sitting down on board, you know. And so all of a sudden, I heard, "You and I must make a pact." My eyes lit up, and I almost had a fit. And so I said, who is that? And I ran around, you know, because the speaker, you know, was taller than him. And then I ran around there and I looked and I saw these five little kids and I saw this little one singing. And I just sat there and I looked at him and I stared at them. And I said, I want that. I want that guy. I want that kid. And so I, you know, um, I said, after they sung, I said to the guy, take me to your leader. And they had a co-manager there. I said, get the guy on the phone. Get the guy on the phone. So 
uh, they uh, uh, they did. And I said, that boy, Jimmy Briscoe, you know, they told me what his name was. I said, I want him, I want to record him. There was a problem. Jimmy would not sign or would not come without his boys. I did not want the Beavers in the beginning because there was already, you know, like a Jackson 5. And I was just a young, uh, you know, a, a young kid myself. So I knew I couldn't compete with, um, you know, the Motown people or, you know, like like that. So if I wanted Jimmy Briscoe, I had to take the Beavers too. So I took the Beavers too. And that was the history of uh, me getting with Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavers. Yes, right there. So um, I, the first song that I bought them in. Now, here's where, you know, the problem was. The Jackson 5, Michael Jackson, 11, 12 years old, he had the baby voice, but he had brothers that were older and more mature. So their voices were like more mature when they recorded. With Jimmy and them, um, they were um, all 11 years old. They all had the baby, you know, they were young, so they all had the baby voices. So um, I don't know if you want to keep this or not. But when I did Why the Fools Fall in Love and, um, you know, um, Sugar Brown, I got Henrietta Young. And I told Henrietta, I said, I want you to come in the studio with me and uh, bring the girls or whatnot. And so I let the Beavers sing, you know, with their voices. But then Henrietta and I was hiding in the ladies' room. And when they left, I brought Henrietta and them in there to over, you know, to go over, like the voices, you know, to make it sound more mature and more full. Now, I don't know if you want to put, keep that in there, but that's what I did. So Henrietta, you know, she did the, you know, she did the voices on that. Um, um, with that, um, then I had the New Sound Express. I had uh, them, uh, a couple other people also, but th those were the people that was important. And so uh, I then... Um, went the shop that, along with my my college my, my buddy Tommy Vetri, you know I can't rule I'm not going to rule him out. So I um, went to um, uh, and that was the last song that him and I ever did together as a, um, a you know um, a, as a team. I I wrote arranged Sugar Brown and um, produced it. So after that. Uh, we um, uh, shopped it to a whole bunch of record companies. And they said, that's okay. You know, like, and then I went to Atlantic and um, Jerry Green, he said, I like it. He said, but I tell you what, I'm going to take it, put it on Atlantic Records. But he said, I'm not giving you a dime. <laughs> that's what he said to me. I'm not giving you no money at all. I said, man. And so the money that was invested, I put in, you know, I wasn't going to get it back, but I said, being on Atlantic Records, that's a good thing. So, we, um, uh, we, we, we did that. I, I got money from um, Jamie Guyton Music with a deal, distribution deal with um, the New Sound Express, by the way. And uh, Red Young, Red Young and them, they were also uh, connected that distribution deal with Jamie Guyton at that time. So, um, Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavers came out on Atlantic Records. And Why the Fool Swell in Love was the, the main song, but everybody kept flipping the song over. Flipping the song over. I went to uh, the New Sound Express that did a stint at the Apollo Theater. They did a good job. They opened for Eddie Kendricks. And so it was coming around Christmas time. And Jimmy Briscoe uh, and them, um, they, um, uh, they were, you know, I, I, I went to... Um, Bobby Schiffman, and I showed him a copy of the record, and I said, anyway, you go get them into the Apollo? And he said, they're cute little kids. i tell you what, Paul, I'll bring them to the Apollo Christmas with Stevie Wonder. And then I said, oh, that'd be fantastic. So he came to this, uh, you know, I was able to do that. But prior to that, that October, around the time, I went to see childhood friends of mine and uh, P, uh, Pee Wee Burgess, uh, Cliffy Perkins, and all, they were the soul generations. And they said they couldn't get a deal. 
they couldn't get a record deal. Uh, they were around. I said, well, I'll, I'll record you guys. And so I did. I, I, I did just that. I um, uh, had taken them into the studio. I, I, I wrote Body and Soul, you know, by the Soul Generations. And on the flip side, though, there were two friends of mine, Larry Brown and Urban Levine. They did the song Tire Yellow Ribbon Around the Old Oak Tree. They had a name. So it was the thought that, oh, if a, a name uh, was, was connected to it, it would be uh, fantastic. It would get played. So during the session, Urban Levine and Larry Brown came out in the studio after I laid the track of Body and Soul. You know, that's the way it's got to be. And they said to me, Paul, you got it. You got a hit. And so I said, okay. So I was shopping the song, Body and Soul. Prior to Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavers going to the Apollo, I couldn't get a deal. And I'm still in college too, you know, still. And so um, got the Beavers to the Apollo Theater. Um, and as um, uh, soon as they walked on the stage, hit, hit. I mean, it, the, the reaction was crazy. The people loved them. You know, they 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 they, they loved them. And, and and Jimmy, you know, singing those songs and whatnot. It was fantastic. Um, it was so fantastic that Bobby Shipman and Apollo, a month later, asked me to bring the Beavers back to the Apollo again, you know? And still I had the Beavers doing stuff, but the um, Soul Generation had not gotten a deal for them yet. So I said, I can't carry. I mean, it's been like seven months already. So I decided to press up 2,000 records. You know, and um, um, I got that done. And um, uh, I sent records down to Baltimore, which I, you know, had a little bit of track record and also to Washington, D.C., in that area, and Philly. And so uh, I put my dorm phone number on the first 2,000 records that I pressed up. And I got a call uh, two weeks later from Baltimore. And they said, you Paul Kaiser? I said, yes. They said, you got that song, Body and Soul by the Soul Generations? I said, yeah, that's mine. And he said, you better press up a whole lot of records. I said, what's the matter? He said, you got a hit on your hands. That was it. History, um, uh, you know, that was the history in the making. Came home that May because, uh, you know, school was out and started putting all of the pieces together you know, for, for that be, that being hit. I had Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavers, you know, working out going on the road and doing things. So I had two things going for me, the New Sound Express. Uh, I, I had them working also, but they were a little bit upset because um, all of a sudden down the Soul Generations is happening and I got Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavers and they felt that they were... Um, you know, being, you know, left out. Well, probably I was, I was, you know, um, the New Sound Express was with me. I mean, me and Tom Ventry had worked work with that thing. He had nothing to do with body and soul. And, and, and that, but he helped me to promote it. And him and his ingenious promotion and whatnot, we got that record number one in a whole lot of stations and whatnot. And me and the soul generation, we began to travel to do things. However, through the music business and things like that, I never had a contract on the Soul Generations. Why should I? We grew up together. We were kids together. We went to high school together. I got a picture of uh, the barbershop quartet in the, my yearbook, and it was three of the Soul Generation. It was me and all of us, you know, taking a picture in, in high school together. So they were my friends. But in the music business, things change. And you, you know, you have the good people in the business and you have the bad people in the business. And I didn't want to do business with the bad people in the business. And eventually that caused, you know, the, the split up of me and the soul generations. It hurt, but all the hits, all the things that they did was, and I had two, was all coming from the, you know, the ideas of me. And I went on, I was, you know, a little bit sad in the beginning. I had not did anything with the beavers 
for a while, but somebody told me, they said, if you got anything in your tank, Paul, you know, you need to get out there and you need to, you know, do something. Now, during that time also, I was doing jingles, commercials, things, because I was an arranger, you know, graduated from college. Um, I, I had the, you know, I had my, my education where I wanted to. So I said, you know, it's time for me to get started, you know, again. So what did I do? I reached out to Jimmy and, and, and the kids, brought them back into the studio and did Where Were You When I Needed You? And that had reasonable success. You know, um, the, you see, because of me being an, an independent, selling 200,000 45s, that's great for me. I mean, that's good. I mean, that's good for me, but not with a major record company. That, that That's not, not good. But, you know, and my other problem that I had um, working with the Beavers was um, they were young, couldn't get them into no clubs. So it had to be festivals, you know, concerts and, you know, and, 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 and things like that. Jimmy was just fantastic. And I will always say that Jimmy was everything. Jimmy had the look that Michael Jackson dreamed of having. Now, I knew I could not compete with them. Um, you know, Jackson 5 doing fast songs and all that stuff. So I said, no, I'm going to make Jimmy a balladeer. I said, Jimmy has that sweet sounding voice. And so when I did Where Were You When I Needed You, you know, we, we, we did very, very well with that song. All of a sudden, I get a call from Jerry Greenberg from Atlantic Records. And, oh, now he wanted to talk with me. and But I was upset because he didn't give me no money, you know, with the Why the Fools Fall in Love. And when I didn't give me a dime. And so I just said, I'm better off you know, keeping the beavers, you know, for myself, which was probably, you know, a, a, a mistake then um, when, when I look, when I look back at it, but there was a secret with the beavers that um, Jimmy knew and no one else knew. And I kept it, I, you know, I, I, I kept it a secret. The beavers were showmen, you know, they could dance and they could step, they could do all that stuff and whatnot. But two of the guys in the Beavers, um, there was a tone, tonality problem. Almost like the way Tommy Bell told me, he never took the stylistics in the studio to sing background. You know, he did it himself with, a, you know, a couple other people. Well, I had the problem with, um, um, how can I put it, with a couple of the guys. Now, that's very, very touchy. When they performed, I had to hide that. I would have Squib, the keyboard player. He would uh, sing a along with the group. Jimmy knew it. And um, when you're cute little kids, you can get away with it. But when you be kidding to get a little bit older, and that could be a little problem. Um, by the way, I, I, I want to bring this to you while, while it's on my mind. Um, I got a call from Squib yesterday. And he told me that um, Robert Makins of Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavers just passed away a day or two ago. Oh, that's so, awesome. the yeah, so Robert is gone. That means there's only two Beavers left. That's Jimmy and Reese, Maurice Pulling, you know. There were a couple other guys that were fill-ins, but I'm talking about the original Jimmy Briscoe mm -hmm. and the Beavers. And I'm saying I probably will go, I will go to the funeral. Um, um, mo you know, mo moving on, I felt that Jimmy could be a superstar. I really felt that. I believed that. But I wanted to get rid of the Beavers, but that wasn't happening with Jimmy. Jimmy was sold on his boys. So, and I liked the guys, you know, th th they were faithful, you know, faithful. So there was nothing I could do. So I came, so... One day in my office, looking out the window, and I'm listening to the radio, uh, this guy named Gary Bird, he was the top DJ on W, not BLS, but um, WWRL radio in New York. And he would always open up his program to saying, good evening, my Ebony Prince and Ebony Princesses of the world. 
And I would always listen to that. I said, you know, I did a song about Sugar Brown, You Wear the Crown of Beauty. And I said, they're going to have me press it. I said, that's an idea. So I went to the piano and I was saying, say, play that, my Ebony Princess, my Ebony. And I kept doing that. And I'm a punchline writer. So when I say that, I always start out with the hook. You know, if I can come out with a great hook, then the rest is passe. So I came out with that hook, My Ebony Princess. Yes, you are. And then I did the opening, the melody, and all those other things that, you know, went with the song. There was a kid that came. As a matter of fact, she, she did background for me, uh, a, a young girl, and her name was Lana Rush. And I took the tape, and I went to her. I said, Lana, tell me what a beautiful princess, what a girl would, you know, somebody would say to a, a, you know, a princess. And I said, your eyes, are, you know, I said, come up with something. And she did. I'll give her, give her, give her all the credit in the world for that, you know. I had to hook my ebony pen. Yes, you are, but coming into, you know, to the, you know, the body of the song, like your eyes are great. Is a, a, a dark as a night. Your skin is beautiful. And when she sung her part in there, and I, had, you know, my part in there, and I said, "Bingo, this is a hit." I think that I got a hit. And so um, I called Jimmy in town, and I got Jimmy. I got Robbie and um, um, the rest of the boys that they, they came in town and went in the studio. I said, when I when I started doing the charts for My Ebony Princess, I said, it's got to be big. So I said, I, I brought in about 40-some musicians, you know, strings, horns, French horns, the whole caboodle. I did that. And so when I laid that track, I brought in, it was this this drummer from um, that just came into town from um, Motown, Andre Smith, got him on drums, which, which will remind me before I... You know, get to that. Uh, one one part I forgot. I met you heard me mention Ron Thomas, guy I used to sing with, and he got drafted and went in the service. He had came home. This is before I did the New Sound Express even, and I played some songs for him that I that I did. And Ron, this he's a very critical guy. He said, "PK, he called me PK." You know, he says, "All right, but it ain't it ain't there." I said, what do you mean? And so he played for me um, some Motown songs and then some other songs that it seemed like the rhythm section was tighter. You know, it was real tight. And so I said, okay. And he, he said, man, you, you know, your stuff, your ideas are good, but, you know, it ain't tight. I mean, listen to it. And I agree with him. So, you know what I started doing? I started going when I went into New York and the you know, looking at albums and things like that, I started looking at the back, the credits. Who played this? Who played that? Who played this? I started contacting those boys and gotten, you know, the cast that used to do in sessions. And when I got them in the studio, everything changed. The rhythm section was tight, you know. String section was always tight. And so, and so when I get back to, now let me get back to My Ebony Princess, the um um when I did that song, um Andrew Smith from Motown, he was in New York looking for work. I brought him into the studio. Billy Nichols on guitar, who wrote the song from the BT Express, you know, do it to your satisfied and all that. I brought Billy <laughs> I brought Billy Nichols in on uh, uh you know there. I brought Tommy Bridwell to play piano because I'm conducting the orchestra. And so I bought in Al Wagner's Philharmonic Strings, you know, the horns, French horns. And I did the horns and the strings at Jimi Hendrix studio, uh, you know, in New York, you know, Electric Lady. Oh, what a sound I got from Electric Lady. I did that. And I went back and um, um, mixed it at um, uh, a recording studio. And I think it was Green Street Recording Studio in, in, in New York. And the person who mixed it and uh, for me, she was a female, a female engineer. And I said it, give me the feel and the sweetness that we and 
Like I call her four o'clock in the morning, so I don't like the way the mix sound. And she would meet me in the studio, and we until we got that My Ebony Princess right. And when I released My Ebony Princess, bingo, it took off. It took off. In the meantime, I needed someone to help me with promotion. I had to bring in a couple of people to uh, work with me. I brought back Ron Thomas to do the promotion. As a matter of fact, Ron Thomas designed the cover of that um, uh, of Jimmy Biscoe and the Beavers. He did it. Ron Thomas designed that. And when I when he took the pictures and everything and brought it back to me, I said, Ronnie, I said, I know what you did when you designed that label. Our when we and Ron Thomas sung, our favorite right, our favorite group that we sung their songs was Little Anthony and the Imperials. So I said, Ron, I think you got that idea from Little Anthony and the Imperials, that album that that they did. So anyway. That's and um, Miami Princess took off. I mean, it was big. We were to go on Soul Train, and I knew. I said, once we go on Soul Train, the ball game is over. So we were all set. Told so everybody was excited. Then I get a call, and they said, "Paul, we're sorry." I said, "What do you mean? Oh, you can't go on Soul Train?" I said, "Why?" You just can't go on. And no one would tell me why, but I know why. Because Jimmy was a threat. Jimmy was a threat to, can you imagine if Jimmy would have been, went on Soul Train and all the little kids, all the little girls would have seen him, you know, all across the country. Um, and then all of a sudden uh, in Atlanta, I suppose got an airplay down there. And all of a sudden, the number one station down there, I get a call. No, he ain't playing the record. And I'm saying, well, what's going on here? What is happening here? So um, there are ways that people can block you. I was a small independent label. And um, I remember when we were doing shows and things like that, we we're doing a show with the Manhattans and the Soul Generations and Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavers because they had that hit record, My Ebony Princess, out. They stole the show. And Jimmy said to me, Mr. Paul, they all called me Mr. Paul, we know what you're going through, you know, and we with you. We stand with you. And that was the way of Jimmy. I tried to pull Jimmy from the group, but I, I couldn't. He, he, he just wouldn't go. I knew I had that problem. If Jimmy would have went solo by himself at that young age and whatnot, Jimmy would have been a superstar. He, you know, I mean, the Beavers could have, you know, went along, but Jimmy was the one. And his allegiance to his boys, to his group, he wouldn't leave. He would not, he would, he would not waver, you know, from that. So with the Be you know, with working with the Beavers, then I came out with a couple of other songs. I did a distribution deal um, uh, down in um, Florida with Henry Stone came out with um, the uh, second album, Invitation to the World, uh, Invitation to the World album. There's one thing that people um, must understand. Yes, yes, that album there, Invitation to the World. And um, you see, running a record company, you can sell a ton of records. And the thing that I learned was this. You got to always have something coming you know, back with it. Um, you ship records like I ship with ship records to my distributors. You know, when I press records, I got to pay within 30 days. But with distributors, they want 60, 90 days before they pay. And if you're a small independent, that is rough. That's why there's none around now. That's why they all got lost. That's why Barry Gordy in 1986 had to sell his company as big as Motown was and he couldn't compete with the, um, the videos and some of the other things that was out there. It was, it was rough. So um, I just, you know, it was very difficult, you know, and we, 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 we did things throughout the years. And so I had a deal, um, Mickey Eichner, I think it was from Columbia. And um, we, you know, the Beavers was doing like a showcase. 
And um, I knew that it was going to be a tough, it was going to be a tough sell. But the B was at rehearsal, at practice, and um, we met in New York at this showcase thing. And they liked the, you know, they liked the group. But, you know, still I had difficult hiding two voices. Can't do it. You know, they were maturing. They were getting older. You know, they, you know, they were getting older now. Um, I, I had gone into, um, um, I taught at Rutgers University for, you know, a year or something like that. I also um, uh, produced other, you know, you know, other artists, um, a group called Storm that made it, to, you know, uh, to, to the charts. And then another group uh, that did very well, a group called Calendar. Uh, Calendar, I did um, a record called, uh, well, I did a whole album on them, but I did a song called Hypertension. And, oh, that song blew up. I mean, that was big. That was big. Polygram was trying to reach me, but through someone else. And um, I'm not going to you know, mention the, the name, but I, I did a deal, and it was huge overseas. Then I wound up doing a distribution deal with Buddha Records, our cast, and um, uh, the, um, with the Beavers, with, with Calendar, Hypertension, Coming On Strong, and all those other records from from calendar um with that um um then the new sound express who i hadn't did nothing with in, in a number of years they came back uh, to me i changed their name to rise and i got another hit record just how sweet is your love by rise which was also later on uh sampled and copied by r kelly with a song called be my number two also Tons of samples on, you know, Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavis uh, songs. Um, My Ebony Princess was sampled by Ace Hood and Rick Ross. And, you know, on a song called Champion, led by, you know, Jasmine Sullivan. And uh, so, you know, um, things, you know, may, uh, go old, but they become, the, you know, they become new, new again. Throughout the years, I've you know, stayed in contact sometimes with Jimmy, and I know he's got two daughters, and now he's got grandchildren. And um, when I, and I it, that took my career. I'll d d discuss that also um, after Calendar and Jimmy Briscoe and and the Beavers. Um, we did a song, a disco dance song. We did into the Milky Way, you know, and um, we did a song called. Um, just to the nick of time, which I, you know, which I did. And, you know, I did um, other songs too. Um, it's, it's, it's funny that um, I, des I decided to build a recording studio after when I did Rise's um, Just How Sweet Is Your Love and then signed them to RCA. And by the way, during that time, I was signed to produce Stephanie Mills. That was after him too, mate. And uh, what happened? Um, they sent the, you know, RCA sent the limousine out, and drove me and my wife up to New York to see Stephanie Mills perform and all that. You know, met him. You know, this was the next thing. Next thing I knew, Diana Ross had signed to, um, you know, um, was it RCA? And Stephanie Mills, after losing the part and um, the Wiz. The movie was, uh, which she probably would have been better off not doing anyway. That was a bad production. And she, and so she left RCA. She left the 26th RCA. And so my deal to produce went down the drain. I said, I don't believe this. I built a recording studio, second largest in, in the state of New Jersey. And um, um, I did a couple of deals. You know, uh, I wasn't into rap, hip hop, but. And uh, there was a kid that came into the studio. Uh, it, it, it's a long story, but I'll just I'll just tell you this here: business was bad, things weren't going well, and I said I wish I had an idea to do something here. I was vacuuming in the floor in my studio, and this guy standing in front of me, and I looked. He had to be about ninety years old, almost ninety years old, and so he said he traveled the world 
And he said, you know, he'd been many places and he want to record his songs. And I said, how many songs? He said, oh, about 100. And I said, oh, well, what do you charge an hour? Oh, 70 bucks an hour. And so he wrote me a check right then and there for the 70 hours. I don't believe that. And that in the meantime, in my studio, I was working with um, the um, the guys from Cool and the Gang, um, Amir Bayan, and some other people that I worked with. Also, Sly Stone, who was, you know, he was done at that time. I mean, he was um, um, brave. The M2 man came in. And there was this kid that came in. I mean, well, I brought, you know, a neighbor of mine said, you got to hear this guy sing. And so I said, okay, I'm coming to the studio. He would call me up and call me. I said, I don't want to be bothered with that guy. And he came one day, you know, um, the old guy, he needed a, a, a singer. So with this singer in to sing background for him, he did almost 100 songs in my studio. Uh, not that many, but a lot of songs he did. And he paid, you know, he, he paid money. The irony of the story is this. When I finished his song, his album and the songs and everything, his keyboard player was an old guy about his age who he he had just met. Well, after the album was done and I gave him the copies of the albums, he said, now I got rest in peace, Paul. And he said, I want to wish you the best and thank you. The next day, he passed away. The guy told me he's gone. He's, he's gone. And... I said, where did he come from? And he said, we don't know. And it was a blessing. You know, I said, that take that as a blessing in the skies. Anyway, Terry Tate, who sung the background, I said, Terry, what do you want me to do? You want me to bring you in the studio and record something or do something? He said, Mr. Kaiser, I work in a place and I teach unwedded mothers, young girls having babies. And I said, really? I said, you mean babies having babies like that? He said, yeah, that's it. I have an idea. I said, what? Then a light bulb went in, off. I said, come on here. I went down in the studio on the, on the piano, and I started playing. I said, Terry, you start singing. And that was, came up with the idea of babies having babies. I, within two days, I had him in the studio, and I recorded Babies Having Babies. Um, a huge huge hit record that was. You know, Atlanta got the rights and they paid me dearly for that record or whatnot. That was the success of uh, Terry Tate's Babies Having Babies. He eventually moved to uh, North Carolina. Terry Terry passed away um, uh, unfortunately. But um, um, when I had that studio, that was the time when everything was changing. You know, the big recording studio was gone. You know, people can afford to get those ADATs and those the Mackie board, which was cheap, and they put it in their house, in their homes. So anybody who came into my studio got a hit record, I lost them as a customer. So eventually, um, that, you know, that, that changed. So um, my cousin was a pastor of a church. His name is... Uh, um, uh, Pastor Kenneth L. Saunders. And so, you know, he had a gospel group. And I always like gospel music. They were called the Singing Pastors. And so he said, PK, he said, you know, we want to do recording. By that time, I had already moved the, um, uh, you know, from the big studio until I built a studio in my house. But let me just tell you this, what happened. As time went on, I went to work with a, a, a record company. They were called Turn Up the Music. And what they did, they did a lot of cover songs. Uh, Drew's famous music cover song. And so I worked with them because of my experience in the business. And um, But prior to that, I had taken sick. Um, come to find out I had a blocked artery. And um, so I had to get that fixed. And I went to a very, very deep depression, you know, because I couldn't do the things that I wanted to do because I was always wanting to go. I was always busy, busy, busy. Um, um, prior to that time, I had, um, I had remarried 
and um, you know, um, all together, a total of eight children and eight kids, which I love dearly. <laughs> That's a lot of kids, you know. So, um, uh, I I remember one time I was getting an award, and I started naming them, and I forgot one. When you got a name that many, you know, so you, you, you and she said, "Daddy, you forgot my name." Ah, uh, I felt terrible. You know, I felt I felt horrible. So I ain't gonna name no names. The <laughs> name book, I'm gonna call all their names out. But um, uh, you know, they were wonderful. You know, wonderful kids. Um, so um, now um, let me put, let me just go to another uh, another part. So after getting um, well, I also did a number of you know show had a number of shows. Russell Thompson Jr. of the Stylistics came to me, and with, with, with his manager, he had just left the Stylistics. He um, he said, "Paul, I know you're doing shows. I did show. I mean, friends with. I knew the Stylistics. Um, I mean, as a um, Ray Goodman and Brown, uh, the Shy Lights, the Manhattans." You, you, you the, the dramatics, uh, Tavari, you know, I knew all those guys. So um, I did a thing called The Big Show with um, uh, like about uh, 20 acts. You know, well, not all, you know, like the first show was like 13 acts, you know, and um, uh, we toured and went all over the, the, the country. And it was, it, was, it was exciting, a wonderful thing and, and, and whatnot. But um, the problem was, you know, you get a lot of copycats. People see me doing something like that, and they start trying to do it too. So um, that don't work. But anyway, Russell came to me. He had stopped singing with the Stylistics. Uh, um, Russell had gotten gotten sick, and nobody cared really about him when, when you know when when he was sick. Remember, Russell with the Stylistics, he led all of the songs, and after a period of time, that could wear you down. So he had not performed for about three years or whatever time. And Russell said to me, Paul, you know, put me on the tour. I have a group to back to, to back me up. And, you know, I said, I knew his manager. You know, I said, okay, Russell, you're on. You know, I'll put you on the tour. So he never forgot that, you know, I, when I put him on the tour. I was in the hospital. And, and I had gone in the hospital and came out. And I had a show going on in Baltimore. There I was in the sick bed. I couldn't even go down to the show because I was sick. And it was the Dells, the Stylistics, and a couple of other, uh, the main ingredient, um, the Persuaders, and a couple of other acts on the show. And they called me. Uh, my nephew called me and said, oh, we got a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, the Dells refused to go on ahead of the um, stylistics, and the stylistics ain't going on. I said, oh, boy. So I said, put Russell on the phone. And I said, Russell, you get on and go ahead of the um, 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 the Dells, and, um, you know, I'll, I'll look out for you when you, you know, when you come back to New York. And he did, you know, Russell went on, so everything went, went fine. And I said, doing shows like this is very, very stressful. So I said, you know, I got out of that. But I did do a video, you know, um, of the big show of 25 of the hottest acts and whatnot. So, along, and also I brought Jimmy Briscoe and them back to Jimmy. He did, he did the tour. He did the, he did the show. And it was fun, you know, seeing them as grown men. And, um, you know, Jimmy still had that, Jimmy still had that voice. But I will always say, if Jimmy would have just went solo, he would have been a superstar, you know. And also, they were with a small independent label like me, and you know, I didn't have the money like those big labels and all those people. I had a family, you know, support. Also, I had to collect. You know, you could sell two hundred thousand records, but then you got to collect the money. And what if a distributor goes bankrupt? You're done, you know. You're, you know, you know, you you're shot. I remember in the beginning, in my career, going into the studio, and the studio owner was standing by the door with his hand out, saying, "Pay me." 
you know, uh, before you go in. So I had to pay before I went in at time. But when I got a name for myself, I didn't have to do that. Um, uh, with the singing pastors, I got, you know, they, they recorded for me um, uh, great. Nominated for two stellar awards. Uh, I did three albums with the singing pastors. We called the singing pastors of the Skyway. I recorded a group called the Gospel Shepherds. I recorded, then brought Rise back. And um, Rise because they, Roscoe was a minister of music. One guy was a preacher. And they all were in the church now. So we did a gospel album. And it was okay, but, you know, if you would take all the, the words off, it would be like Rise with, a, you know, something popping there. Um I also did, and and I forgot to mention them. I also did an album which was played whenever Muhammad Ali went in the ring to fight, and I did the Super Disco Band album, and that was pretty big, you know, in, in the clubs and, and whatnot. The um, Terry Tate album was one of my, uh, you know, one of my biggest. I mean, you know, that that Babies Having Babies went um, top ten, big song, you know, did very very well. Um, um, with the singing pastors, we went on tour. I think that they were doing it for fun because they all were preachers. But then when I started getting bookings for them and tr they were traveling one night, they asked to have a meeting with me and they said, Brother Kaiser, you know, we're pastors. We got churches here. We can't be traveling all over the country. Mm -hmm. I said, well, what do you guys think when I decided to get, you know, to, to get you guys? So I did them um, and a, a bunch of gospel albums, uh, Renee Connell, I did that. And so, you know, summarizing, I know I forgot a bunch of things still, but um, summarizing now, um, before the pandemic came in, I recorded this artist, Sarah Bella. The, digitally, the song was taken off, um, did very well, went to number one on the digital charts. Um, she never... We never came back with anything. So I said, after all of this stuff and whatnot, my granddaughter could sing. And so now, up to date, I'm working with my granddaughter. Her name is Parker J. And she has a album out called Lifeline. And a new single that is on YouTube is called Lifeline. I mean, she's good. She comes in. Well, Grandpa, this is she writes and do, you know, do all the things and whatnot. And uh, they, they, they're still, I lost my brother, Teddy, um, who was uh, who was always, you know, behind me, supporting uh, supporting my brother. And um, uh, my, I'm still friends with my buddy, Ron Thomas, who we started singing together at maybe 11 years old, something like that. And so um, he was the one that, you know, when I had that off at Motown, he came out to celebrate with me, you know, and, you know, all of that. So. Um, and we we were the type of guys where we would go out on dates when we were young. I dated the older sister. He dated the younger sister. We were, <laughs> we were funny, Ron Thomas. Um, and um, that was it. My lovely wife, um, now Diane, she's an accountant, and um, she's in full support of me. And um, we, um, you know, we, we work together with senior citizens now, you know. <laughs> and um, we're up there, so... I enjoy, you know, um, um, what I'm doing, and uh, I'm still in the music business. And I just did an album less than a year ago by a group called um, The Jack Moves. Tell people to look that up. They hired me to, you know, do the arrangement, horns and strings, and it's like a retro type song. But The Jack Moves, you look, tell them look it up on YouTube. They're doing, they're on tour now, but they hired me to go in. So. Um, they said I still got it so <laughs> I mean it was fun I, I enjoyed doing you know the album and it keeps me young and as long as I use my brain I guess that I'll you know I, I will continue but out of all the acts out of all the things I did you know in, you know, in, in my music business and I want to think, think twice before I say this um, the warmest thing was Jimmy Briscoe he was fantastic. Jimmy Briscoe was a fantastic singer. I wish that I would have had him as a singer artist, but the Beavers were wonderful kids. 
And Jimmy, on an interview, Jimmy had said that uh, we were in the studio recording and Robbie's mother or somebody passed away. No, it wasn't, it wasn't his mother. It was Robbie's father that was murdered. And we were in the studio finishing up an album. And I had to put Robbie on a bus and sent Kenny Robinson to take him, you know, to Baltimore because um, of what happened. And Robbie was crying when he left the studio. He kept asking, Mr. Paul, what, what's going on? How can I tell a kid that? Here we are in the studio. And so what we said, let's do this for Robbie. Let's do this for Robbie. And I said, now Robbie's gone. He passed a couple of days ago. So my allegiance will always be to Jimmy Briscoe and the Little Beavers or the Beavers and whatnot. And the other thing is this. Had they not canceled us on Soul Train, history would have been rewritten. I don't know why they did it, but here we had a big record, My Ebony Princess. All we needed was to go on Soul Train. But through something that happened, they blocked us. And a couple of radio stations blocked us out of fear. When you're a small, you know, little small label, you don't have the power, you know what I'm saying, to do the different things. And that's part of the story. You know, there's probably a lot more that I forgot, but um, I hope great. that I did the best. You, you're doing great. Paul, how do you want Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavis to be uh, remembered? As an act that were as great as the Jackson Five, a great group, and if you don't believe it, listen to their songs on YouTube. Because when I read the things that people are saying about the Beavers on YouTube, like, I never heard of this group, some of them might say. They're as big, they're as good as the Jackson Five. Some people say they're even better. The, the music and the things, the production is better. So, you know, I want them to understand that this was a group that was on a small label, but with a big heart and a great sound. They never, you know, left me, left me. They stuck with me. And even though I was a little guy, a small label. And I want to thank Jimmy and them for that. Yeah, I have both of their albums and I was also a CD with unreleased tracks. And I can only say there's not one weak track on both of these albums. There are stone cold classics. Uh, and now with the vinyl hype, People are getting interest into these groups from the 70s. And many people are now getting, like you said, getting into, into Jimmy Beaver. And it's just phenomenal. And I, I'm so happy for them, for the group to be acknowledged after all these years. Thank you very much. Yes. yes. The champion, like I said, the song Champion was a track of, of My Emily Princess, mm -hmm. sung by Jasmine Sullivan. And uh, Rick and wrapped by Rick Ross, and they said, "Yeah." Thank you so much, Paul, for your time. It's it's so great to have now the story from your perspective, from the promoter and and the songwriting and everything. Because people were wondering why didn't they took off? What was the tiny little thing that was missing? Because you you discovered them, you had so much talent yourself. You know, it's. Mm -hmm. Getting hired by Motown as a songwriter, you really had to be good. You you really had to be outstanding. So, right. right. Yeah. Yes. I, th thank you very much for that. Thank you, Paul. You are a legend. Let me tell you that. Oh. Really. <laughs> thank you. I, I can't appreciate your time and and doing this interview with me. And thanks once again from the deepest of my heart because I'm, I'm so happy now to have that missing link of, of Jimmy Briscoe. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you, thank you. God bless you.